Um, I tell you what, we'll go ahead and start this session now. And uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be joined today uh, by several uh, folks that we think a great deal of here at AAKP. Um, today's final session is called Paving the Way for a Better Tomorrow, Understanding Clinical Trials. It's proudly sponsored by Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals. And as president of AAKP, it's my honor to serve as a moderator for this session. AAKP is truly a champion of innovation in the kidney space, as we talked about this morning and as you saw before lunch. And not only do we advocate for it, but we help shape it by having AAKP represent uh, the organization and patients on a number of work groups, committees, and coalitions, all aimed at advancing science and uh, bringing more and better treatments in today's uh, world to kidney patients, as well as those who have yet to be diagnosed. But it all starts with you. And so for the folks in this room, uh, we have two speakers. Uh, they're absolutely tremendous. First, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Scott Toner. Uh, Scott is an AAKP board member and the Life Sciences and an executive with Life Sciences with experience in both the pharmaceutical and biotechnology markets and a focused specialty in nephrology products. Uh, he's Senior Vice President Commercial at Proteon Therapeutics, a company focused on vascular diseases. Although Scott will be uh, taking off his industry hat today and putting on an AAKP tie. Uh, <laughs> uh, he'll be sharing his industry expertise with us on the evolution of patient involvement in clinical trials. Come on, Scott. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this afternoon, uh, I'm going to attempt to take you in a 15-minute period um, an entire walk from drug discovery all the way through commercialization. So it shouldn't, shouldn't be a challenge for us, right? Um, so let me start off with the disclaimer. Um, everything you're going to hear today, uh, this afternoon in this talk, is my opinion. does not represent uh, the opinions of my employer, Proteon Therapeutics. Um, so this is, these are the topics that I'd like to try to walk through today. I want to give you some familiarity with the actual drug development process, the various stages that um, development goes through, the timelines that are associated with it. We'll talk a little bit about um, the drug development costs. We'll talk about the FDA's involvement, when they get involved, how they get involved, how they actually offer you some protection and safety uh, if you choose to get involved in a clinical study. Uh, we'll talk about the actual clinical study process, your rights and responsibilities. We'll talk about how FDA actually comes back at the very end and reviews and approves, hopefully, um, a new product that's being developed. And I'll give you some closing thoughts um, to lead into Garrett's um, presentation. So with that said, the first thing to understand is a little bit about the clinical development process. How do, how do drugs actually start? So it used to be that drugs would be discovered um, sort of almost by accident, that um, they'd be tested in some kind of a petri dish and be found to have some effects and they'd be developed into that drug. Today, nowadays, it's more rational drug design. They know what is happening in a cell or what they want to alter in a cell, and so they tend to develop a drug specifically targeting a function of the cell or a function of the organ. Um, with that said, this process involves going back and forth through a series of cell line models, um, animal models, and it takes quite a while, uh, anywhere from two to 10 years. I know actually some that have taken quite a bit longer than that. Um, I think the important thing to understand though is even with rational drug design, probably not better than one in 10 drugs that are actually discovered and started into this process actually make it all the way through to the end. So. It's an arduous process, to say the least. So after it's approved or after it's been used in these animal studies and, uh, and cell lines, it'll go into uh, what's called phase one clinical development. Now the goal of phase one is typically to establish that the drug is safe. And so rather than using patients, uh, companies will tend to use normal healthy patients or normal healthy individuals. And the reason for that is, as you well can understand, Patients tend to be sick and they just naturally, as part of the disease, tend to have a lot of side effects uh, as it relates to the disease. And here the goal is actually to say specifically what side effects might the drug have. And so um, that's the goal in this. These are usually relatively short studies, relatively small number of people, and actually the success rate is pretty good. Probably two-thirds of drugs actually make it through phase one. 
At that point, it goes into phase two, and this is where we transition to patients. Um, and the objective of phase two typically is to find the sweet spot, um, and that's the sweet spot between the efficacy, the benefit that the drug is hoping to achieve, and the side effects. And I'm sure many of you that have been through different uh, drug regimens know the higher you dose a drug, typically the higher the side effects tend to be. And so the goal in this section uh, in phase two is really to find that right balance. Um, these can be uh, larger studies, uh, 100 to 300 patients. Um, they're a little bit longer, one to two years on average. And this is where we start to get some pretty significant fall off. So um, probably a third, certainly less than 50% of the drugs actually will succeed at this stage and move, move onward. And then finally, phase three. Um, phase three, you might also hear, is a late stage uh, clinical trial. It's also called pivotal uh, uh, clinical trials. And these tend to be very large numbers of patients and very long durations. Now, in nephrology, this tends to be a little on the smaller side. Most of our studies in the nephrology space tend to be in the 800, six, you know, 700, maybe 1,000. Um, but for those um, who are taking cardiovascular drugs or lipid drugs, they tend to be up in the many thousands of patients, and they extend over very long periods of time. Because here what we're trying to do is, again, establish the benefit that's sustained over a long time, but also to tease out those smaller side effects that can only be seen when you're exposing lots and lots of different patients. And so most likely, if you have an interest in uh, getting involved in a clinical study or your approach to participate in a clinical study, most likely it's going to be in one of these late stage uh, trials. Bottom line though, when you add all of these together, um, only 13 to 32 percent, it depends on the type of drug, the type of disease it's targeting, make it from the beginning all the way to through to FDA approval. So there are a lot of dead soldiers. Um, in fact, I was commenting before, nephrology in particular um, has been described as a graveyard for uh, for drug development because it's so hard in this space to actually identify that clinical benefit and the safety profile that will go with it. Um, so it's, this is particularly challenging space. So as you can imagine from the, those slides, it takes a long time. And I've kind of given you um, some broad uh, categories of timelines, but here if you look at it, you can see one year, two years, three years, and all of these different phases. In the end, from the beginning to final approval at FDA, a typical drug nowadays will take over 10 years uh, to, uh, to be approved, if it's approved. So you can imagine that actually also leads to an awful lot of costs. So there are several different ways we can look at costs. So the first is just literally how much money does it take out of pocket uh, to pay the investigators to do the manufacturing development and all of that. And that's on average, $1.4 billion. But you can also think, I just told you, it's a 10-year process. So during that 10 years, you can almost think of it as that $1.4 billion as a loan. Um, that money could have been invested somewhere else and doing something else. And so there's a deferred earnings uh, element to this as well that tends to be almost as much as the direct out-of-pocket, almost $1.2 billion. And then finally, uh, post-approval, there are continuing safety studies, indications for new, uh, new indications that might want to be pursued, and that can add, on average, another third of a million dollars, a third of a billion dollars, I'm sorry. So on average, a new drug, start to finish, is $2.9 billion. Now that does include, that's not the cost of just the drug that succeed. That's the cost in totality of all those drugs that never made it, but that's, that's the, what the industry is facing. So with that, I want to segment over now to talk about um, the actual studies and what the safeguards that are built into the system if you wanted to uh, start to participate in this. So it starts with an IND. So this is, if you think back to the preclinical uh, development that I talked about, companies have done up to 10 years of work um, working with this drug in various cell lines and animals, and they have a massive amount of data in terms of how the drug works, what the, what the safety profile uh, might look like. And so the companies will file an application with FDA, which is called this IND. Um, so the IND uh, takes all of that preclinical data, 
Sometimes drugs have been used very early outside the U.S. Some companies are much more lenient in terms of uh, taking, taking drugs into patients. Um, they're going to take a lot of manufacturing information. Manufacturing information is really critical if it's not stable, reproducible. The drug might look good one time and then look terrible the next, so this is critical, and FDA has tremendous uh, insight into quality manufacturing processes. Um, they'll take a look at the study protocol, and the study protocol is the step-by-step -step plan. Everything that's going to be done by every investigator, by the patients, all the lab work that has to be done, they'll review that to make sure that it actually is going to be able to prove that the drug is safe and efficacious. They'll look at the qualification of the investigators. We're going to talk about this later. We're going to uh, talk about the informed consent process. Um, we're going to talk about an IRB process, which is an extra safeguard. Uh, that you have, and then they'll just check to make sure the company is prepared to follow all the rules and regulations uh, that are necessary. Um, so what is an IRB? So after FDA has done their job, then the organization will typically go to an IRB. Now this, the IRB might be at the hospital level, it might be at a system-wide level where a number of uh, hospitals have banded together. But bottom line, the, the IRB is an independent group, and their only purpose is in addition to what FDA has done, is to make sure that the clinical trial makes sense and that the risk um, is exceeded by the presumed benefits um, of the drug in the, in the setting and as part of this clinical trial. They look at the protocol just the way FDA did to make sure that it will, it's reasonable to assume that it'll prove uh, successful. And then in addition to doing this just one time, the IRB is actually constantly reviewing any changes, any new information that might come up. Um, if there's a safety signal that is picked up during the clinical trial, the IRB will be on top of that. Um, and uh, they will look at any compensation uh, that might be flowing to the investigator, to the patients, uh, whatever. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so what are your rights uh, and responsibilities if you choose to uh, participate in a clinical study? Well, typically what will happen is your physician will introduce you to the idea of would you be interested in uh, participating in a clinical study. And oftentimes, uh, if it's a company-sponsored uh, uh, development product, they might have a, a small brochure for you to take a look at, lay out a little bit of information about what the product does, what the study is in intending to do, what your responsibilities are, and uh, what the visit schedule might look like. But that's just the opening gambit, so to speak. What would happen at that point, you'd make a decision of, yes, I'd, I'd like to know more. And at that point, one of the study investigators uh, will actually sit down with you in a very detailed review. It's almost like a contract. And they will review point by point with you all of the pertinent information so you can make an informed decision of whether you want to participate in the study. And the type of questions that they will, that are included in this uh, uh, consent form are what's the purpose of the study, how many people are going to be participating, how long am I committing to, how long is the study going to be, what's going to happen uh, during this study, what are the risks, obviously, one of the most important ones, but then what could be the benefits to me. And, and think about these clinical studies. Most clinical studies are randomized to a treatment arm and a blinded uh, non-treatment arms or placebo arm. So sometimes it's a 50-50 chance of whether you'll actually get the investigational drug or a placebo. Sometimes it's two or three to one, so you, there's a greater likelihood of you succeeding. But that's, that's the only way we can determine whether the drug is working, that a person on a blinded basis is assigned either the active drug or the uh, placebo drug. Importantly, if you don't participate in this clinical study, what other options do you have for treatment? Will it cost you anything? Uh, well, very rarely would it cost you anything, but the flip side of that coin, of course, would be, would you be paid for participating? And sometimes you are paid, um, but it's a very nominal amount that you're going to receive as compensation, something to basically offset transportation, uh, parking, things like that. And the reason is um, it would be irresponsible for a company to induce a patient to participate in a study um, by offering them money. And so you want to take that off the table and simply make it as neutral as possible uh, for the, the patient to, um, to participate. 
who's funding the study? I mean, it could be a, a company, if it's a new molecule, it's likely that it's a, it's a company that's developing it, but it could be the hospital, it could be a government-sponsored NIH study, it could be a lot. Um, it'll go over what happens if you're injured, about confidentiality, how your health information would be used, basically a review of HIPAA uh, regulations. Um, is the study voluntary? Well, it, it most certainly is voluntary. And you do have the opportunity to drop out, but I'm going to loop back to that on the consequences of dropping out in a bit. Um, uh, will you review, receive new information as the study goes on? And absolutely you will. If um, uh, things are discovered about the drug or the trial during, uh, during the con conduct of the study, you will be notified about that. But um, can someone else end your participation? Well, they can. It's generally for your not... Uh, participating and showing up uh, to, to your study visits, um, uh, being non-compliant in the study. And then there'll be also uh, someone to contact if you have additional questions. So if you do choose to participate in a clinical study, it's really important that you take your responsibilities uh, very seriously. And basically this is making sure that you uh, get to your scheduled appointments. And the reason this is so important it's a personal decision, of course, if you want to drop out, and that's perfectly understandable and reasonable. But if you think about it, there's a lot of detailed calculation. They know ex when you're developing a drug, you know exactly the benefit that you expect to see of the drug. And what ends up happening is you develop the study size with a certain number of patients to achieve that statistical benefit. If what ends up happening is people start dropping out, all of a sudden, a drug that might actually work very well might simply not show that it worked because there weren't enough people that participated. So really think about it up front. If you, if you don't think you're going to be able to make scheduled visits, don't sign up for the study. If you sign up for the study, do everything you possibly can to, uh, to stay in the study. So for your safety, FDA remains very active throughout this entire process. So it starts with that, what I described early on, this pre-IND, where the company presents all of the basic data that they have um, on the study drug. At the end of phase two, before they go into the pivotal study, the uh, FDA will look at the study drug again. They will review the protocols to make sure that the, the pivotal study is actually going to be able to prove whether the drug works or not. Um, at the end of the phase three, the company will go back again uh, and apply for a new drug, uh, uh, new drug application or biological application, and that's a very detailed uh, process. I mean, to give you a sense for this, I'm old enough and have been involved in clinical studies long enough that we actually did it on paper. It's all done electronically now, but the last drug file that we did that was on paper filled floor to ceiling, front to back on an 18-wheeler. That was the application. That's the amount of paperwork that goes into these applications. It's enormous. That's why it's done electronically now. Um, and at the end of this process, the, um, the FDA will either come back, hopefully, with an approval, or sometimes, not terribly uncommonly, they'll come back and simply say, thank you. You did everything we asked. We need more evidence in, in one manner or another. So I want to leave you with this one final thought, which is, as I mentioned to you, nephrology is a particularly difficult um, place. And because of it, um, a lot of companies have been scared to, to actually invest in drug development in this area. I mean, if you look at all the different drug, uh, all the different uh, specialty areas that have been involved uh, in clinical studies, oncology, nervous system, cardiovascular, nephrology la uh, ranks last in terms of the number of clinical studies. This is not where we want to be. We want to work to bring better drugs to patients, and I believe that's exactly what Garrett's going to, uh, uh, to tell you. So with that, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Garrett Hamm. Uh, Garrett is a clinical project manager at the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, also known as CTTI. And CTTI is a formal uh, collaborative between Duke University and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And Garrett was just commenting at the table here 
um, that he had no real idea of uh, the dearth of development in the kidney space. But let me let, tell you a little bit about Garrett. Uh, we've worked together for about two years. I've had the pleasure of working on one of the projects at CTTI, uh, which is designed to um, engage patients better through remote medical technology uh, so that more patients can be involved in clinical trials uh, on the technology and on the platforms they're used to to increase the rate of participation and sustain it. But Garrett's insights into this process I think will be pretty unique for all of us and then after this uh, we'll do a Q&A because both of these folks are the technicians and the innovators in driving clinical trials and your ability to interact with them is very unique. So without further ado, Garrett, come on up. So I'm gonna come up with my telephone. I'm not ringing anybody. I just wanna make sure that I don't go long on time. Um, yes, yeah, so Garrett Harmery, very happy uh, to be here. I have walked, had the pleasure of working with Paul for a couple of years now, and I've spent about, about 20 years in, in different capacities in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Prior to joining City a few years ago, I worked at the Food and Drug Administration for several years as well, and done a couple other things. Um, but, but, but when it comes to therapeutic area expertise, um, I, I traditionally had worked in uh, cardiovascular or HIV-related spaces um, before transitioning to just general clinical trial um, design and execution. Similar to a uh, Scott disclaimer, this is Garrett Homry speaking here. Uh, I am technically an employee at, at Duke and, and, and tied to both Duke and the Food and Drug Administration, um, but, but these are really um, my thoughts on, um, on, on the state of play of things. So City, the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative was started about 10 years ago by Duke and, and FDA. It's a, it's a member organization. There are about 80 different folks involved. The general idea was all of this information that Scott was presenting to you, it's agonizing. Whether you've worked for 30 years in this space or this is the first time that you've looked at clinical trials, you look at these numbers, $3 billion, these years, 10 years, these failure rates, and uh, it, it, it's pretty inconceivable. So City was, was dreamt up along with a few other initiatives, Critical Path, Transcelerate, there's other stuff out there. Trying to say, you know, can we bring everybody that's involved in this space together and, and see how we might be able to design and execute things so that it might make um, all boats rise. So there's about 80 different members, but we work far outside of that. Um, broken into several groups, so at the top you see um, industry sponsors, so think of those actual manufacturers that, that make the drugs, Merck, Novartis, Lilly, et cetera. Also clinical research organizations, the, the folks that actually run the, the clinical trials that engage with investigators and, and patients. Um, along with FDA, we've got other government partners, uh, National Institute of Health, the VA, CDC, et cetera. Critically, this middle group, um, this middle group uh, are, are all patient groups. So we've got about 20 different patient advocacy organizations, whether it's Friends of Cancer Research, uh, uh, Crohn's and Colitis, uh, uh, Parkinson's Foundation, et cetera, all sorts of patient groups. City was, was one of the early organizations that really tried to drive um, a, a greater inclusion of patient groups at a time when, when you know, very few organizations were doing it. One of the neat things about working with Scott is that 25 years ago when he was designing trials, he was already bringing the patient voice in Interestingly, that's, that, that's still not really a common thing. Um, we are working to improve that city and some other organizations are involved. Also lots of um, academic organizations. You know, I'm technically a Duke employee. My wife and I live in Durham, North Carolina, Yale University, Kansas, um, work with academic institutions. And then this bottom group, um, IRBs, which may be a new term to some folks. We've got lots of IRB groups, trade associations, professional societies, trying to bring everybody in the room to work on various projects to improve efficiency, improve quality, um, the types of things that we hope can bring drugs to market faster and, and ultimately drive down costs. So City works on all different aspects of clinical trial design, but one of the things that we've really held our hat on um, is um, 
patient engagement in actual design and conducting of clinical trials. So 2008, right about the time that we started, we were already focused on this, on this patient advocate reality. So we immediately wanted to have patient advocates on our executive committee, on our steering committee, on project teams to make sure that there was a voice given to the ultimate recipient of drugs, patients. Um, that, that became more formalized in 2013. We created a patient leadership ca uh, council, again, trying to drive home this idea of norm, no question asked, inclusions of patients as equal partners when it comes to designing clinical trials. We also, at that point in time, launched our first patient groups and clinical trials project, and, and that's what I'll turn to talking about in just a moment. 2015, we expanded even further in this regard. You know, they had a realization from our patient leadership council that no, that's, we, don't, we don't want kind of a separate side table where you consult us from time to time. We want to be fully integrated as steering committee members. This obviously makes sense. It jives with, you know, kind of the philosophy that we've been talking about all along. And now we have kind of these 20 different patient groups out of the 80 total groups across various fields. Um, we also realized that, that what we needed to do was try and squeeze money to actually reimburse patients to make it to meetings and stuff like that. Um, when I was when I worked at FDA, when I worked at industry, now at Duke, well, s meetings come about. You know, there's you you can have a piece of a budget for plane, hotels, etc. Lots of patients don't have it. How are you really going to have have those voices there if you're not able to try and squeeze the dollars to make that happen? Um, and then uh, in December 2017, I'll kind of jump ahead and then I'll jump back. December 2017 started our latest, you know, very exciting partnership where City and FDA are launching a patient engagement collaborative. Um, I'll talk about that for a moment, but then I'm going to pull back to the work of the preceding five years. Um, almost every city project that has, you know, formal recommendations, all of this is available online, free to anybody who's, who's interested in accessing it. They include a recommendation to involve all stakeholders, particularly patients, in the process. But critically, we give a lot of specific examples that we hope companies and, 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 and patients like yourselves can actually take advantage of so that it's not just kind of a, a window dressing remark. Uh, just a tiny bit of details um, on the patient engagement collaborative that's just begun and, and, and will be ongoing over, uh, over the, at least the next year to two years. So this is a forum uh, for the patient community to engage ideas directly with the FDA about increasing meaningful patient engagement uh, in regulatory decisions and medical products. I mean, listen, FDA is, is no different than most um, industry sponsors and manufacturers that theoretically they certainly understand the need and value of patient engagement, but kind of the how to involve um, it's, it's still a work in progress. There's a federal notice in December 2017 soliciting um, applications. Dozens came in. Um, city's currently undergoing a, a review process that should be done by this summer. Um, diverse perspectives will be brought in, into the target of 16 different groups. Public announcement will happen after completion of that project. I'm not actually responsible for this one. It's my colleague, Zach Hallinan, but we've got lots of information online, and if you want to learn more about it, grab my email address and I can point you in the right direction. But going back to that kind of 2014 era when we started uh, formal projects on patient groups and clinical trials, it started around a few issues, right? You know, it, it, it wasn't hard to appreciate we needed patient engagement in these issues, but there was really a gap in knowledge and understanding about how best to include and how best to utilize the patient voice. Um, there also wasn't a lot of evidence out there on best guidelines, on guidelines and practices. You know, we've got all kinds of guidelines on pharmacology, on pharmacokinetics, on biostatistics, on how to use investigators, but how to actually incorporate um, patients. There, there, there wasn't a lot of solid information out there. So that's, that's a good type of thing that the city tends to jump into. Where can we develop actionable recommendations and metrics to try and move the needle here? The way that we operate, we put together a multi-stakeholder group. So you've got those industry folks, the FDA folks, CROs, um, maybe institutional review boards, et cetera, patients. Let's come together and let's work on this. So the initial project objectives, there are a couple things going on. One, uh, wanted to identify best practices for engaging patient groups in clinical trials. There is a slew of information online. Um, uh, and again, free access to, to anybody who's interested. First, there's, there's an extensive document on effective engagement with patient groups around clinical trials. I'll show you a couple really busy slides following this to give you an idea of some of the topics covered. 
Um, also, we created uh, information on patient group organizational expertise and assets evaluation. How do we help develop the skills within patients themselves that they can, that they can become more active partners? Also got some work on, um, on, on how best to engage with other external relationships, linking folks like AAKP with great Parkinson's folks, et cetera. And then, so we've got all sorts of com completed information there. We've got ongoing work also um, describing the value and impact of engaging patient, patients in clinical trials. Um, this includes working on um, an economic model to quantify the financial value of, of patient engagement and developing kind of high benefit, low investment engagement methods. My, my compliment to Scott earlier was sincere. This is the type of thing that, that the organizations he been, uh, has been involved with, they picked up on long ago. But you've got a lot of other companies that are racing with deadlines and, and these are difficult trials to conduct and they're expensive. To try and suggest adding something new to it, you kind of need to pitch it. So uh, a big part of the city work now isn't just trying to connect with patients and help them get the tools to become more involved, but it's developing case models, economic models, that, that case studies and economic models that we can then take to pharma companies and say, see, this is the financial net present value benefit to you through involving patients earlier to make, uh, to make your, your protocols faster, leaner, um, more effective. Y your, your profits can increase too. So these are my two incredibly busy slides. They break every rule in making slides. But since I don't have 90 minutes to talk to you about um, the various you know, tools that are out there for you, this middle bar captures a lot of the information that, um, that was shared by Scott. So you've got the pre-discovery, pre-clinical, phase one, two, phase three, and then post-FDA approval. Through all of those stages, we've got two slides that are, that are similar. So if you're dizzy now, hold tight. You've got a couple more minutes of it. So um, one, so we've got specific examples on how to build a model to evaluate impact, specific examples on the where and how we can incorporate patients into designing better clinical trials leading to improved outcomes. Um, I won't talk you through all of them. I wanted to highlight them so that you can then have, so I've got a 40 page document on this online and all sorts of other things. Um, but you've got all sorts of specific examples, serving on an FDA advisory committee, becoming involved in protocol designs, all sorts of opportunities, specific designated opportunities to become to become an equal partner in this process. The recommendations document, uh, the primary one is about 40 pages. And again, going from pre-discovery, pre-clinical, phase one, two, and three, all the way through FDA approval and beyond, giving specific example areas where you can become involved and help improve this process. So with that being said, all right, Garrett's standing up here talking about Patients Matter and everybody should get it, and Scott's been doing it for 25 years. Why isn't everybody then? Well, it's not easy. Um, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of barriers have been identified, and, and this is something that we also work uh, ad nauseum, frankly, to address with our project work. You know, it, it is difficult to identify and engage with patient groups when you have folks like Paul and AAKP who have been doing this for a long time. You've, you've figured out some sophisticated methods of engaging, but if you're just patient one in Kansas who hasn't been involved in this, it's a little tricky. You know, there could be, be kind of a lack of sophistication and understanding of FDA regs, biostats, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some challenges there. Um, oftentimes, frankly, people started to, to get the gist about involving patients, but it was kind of only a, a token seat at the table. So we've tried to, tried to develop tools to make it a more, um, a more uh, a, a genuine partnership um, again, that lack of engagement and best practices, we've got a lot more information, city and other groups now, uh, now have a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of great materials that you can work with. That lack of demonstrated value, we're trying to t fill that void with case studies, economic models for sponsor organizations, et cetera. And, and, and frankly, uh, I forget if it's a specific, uh, internal resistance, just lack of buy-in. Ch change is hard, whether it's, take your pick, um, uh, lifestyle changes, weight loss, et cetera, et cetera. Change is hard, but there's, there's a lot of great tools out there now. Um, the stuff that you'll find online, um, we, we break up the recommendations package uh, into a few different sections. One, we've got a slew of information for all stakeholders, how to engage the patient voice, how to define expectations, roles, responsibilities, how to build the trust required. Um, slew of, of recommendations directly towards all stakeholders. 
Then we've also got large sections that are um, designated directly to patient groups, how to promote your value as an essential partner, how to deliver your expertise, build upon that expertise with research sponsors, how patient groups should select sponsors and vice versa. And then there's also um, a sponsor directed recommendations, uh, helping sponsors to match with the right patient groups, establishing guiding principles, clear lines of communications. This is messy, difficult work. What are some of the things that we can do to, to, to help make it easier? Again, talking about this measuring impact of, of patient group engagement, you'll, you'll see more of this in the next six, six to nine months from city. A lot of this stuff is getting wrapped up now. Bottom line is that we've got a ton of evidence, we've got a ton of buy-in and a ton of tools now that, that can help demonstrate that unique value to research partners that patient groups provide. Um, I showed you the busy slide with 50 examples. Wanted to cull it down for just a few critical examples. Um, it, you, you really do find that you can de-risk early stage development by working with, say, somebody with, with kidney issues and the protocol design, um, reducing uncertainty in the regulatory process. You can speed up that timeline. Helping to develop more effective, efficient trials with a greater chance of success. We see it in a lot of examples now. Better questions about study design coming from patients, leading to more efficient recruitment, improved retention, fewer protocol amendments. If you have to make a formal change in the protocol, it takes time. It is expensive. It slows the train down. It stops or slows uh, recruitment. So, so there really are legitimate, well understood benefits at this point in time. Um, I'm at 15 minutes and 30 seconds. I will say thank you and uh, happy to stick around and answer questions. So whatever you wanted to know about clinical trials and how to get involved, two very experienced uh, practitioners, um, top in their field. Any questions from folks? Um, because they're, okay. <laughs> they're more than happy to help. Um, there's a microphone right here in the middle. It might be uh, easier for uh, recording purposes. Yeah, or, or you want to pass it, Richard? Yeah. That's great. Yep. Yep. Well, for you, Ken, you come on. <laughs> and if you could, just for the taping, just sure. let folks yeah. know who you are. Um, my name is uh, Kevin Fowler. I'm the board of directors for the American Association of Kidney Patients. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I guess here's one thing I see. You know, Joy, Scott, your presentation, and Garrett, both very good. But one, I just wonder if you guys could address one thing too, is that it seems like everyone is doing different initiatives like this. Like there was a recent National Academy of Science meeting where I was at, but it just seems to be a lot of redundancy and it seems like we could do a better job we are working together. So any comments on any initiatives to do that? Because um, it seems like it's gonna be a real good opportunity to start pulling the stuff together and working with one direction. So, thanks. <laughs> Sure, you had to open with the hardest question, right? <laughs> That's me. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's difficult, um, at least from an industry perspective. Most, you know, most companies obviously are public, uh, public companies working on their own, working to their shareholders. And so while at least the companies I've worked with um, have been interested in, willing to, and wanted to engage with patients, it tends to be much faster, more efficient, to reach out directly to the patients than necessarily involve other large groups. Because by involving other larger groups, you also tend to slow the process down. That is, unless you don't already recognize the value of it. Um, so I, I love the idea, especially recently. I, I, you know, I, the idea of working with groups like AAKP to help with recruitment and things like that, I think makes perfect sense. That actually you know, facilitates, it doesn't slow things down. Um, so, but some of the other groups, uh, unfortunately, I just, I don't have personal experience with. It's not just the patient group, it's like, it's all the different initiatives out there. So, yeah, we, um, there, there's a common term now, uh, uh, consortium fatigue. There's so many now. Um, now it's, I, I suppose it's better than the opposite problem, but, but it's, it's problematic. So you've got city and Transcelerate and, you know, uh, uh, Faster Cures. You've got a few come to mind that are very similar. I, I've got... We tend to, as project managers, have three projects at a given time. And uh, one of my other projects, so we talked a lot about the mobile or decentralized clinical trials. 
I've also got a project on real world evidence. So how are you going to incorporate EHR and claims? And I've got a, a two day meeting that, that uh, our, our project team is hosting next week in DC. And uh, there's going to be a lot of great people there and it's wonderful and this, that and the other. But it's frankly hard to schedule people because Friends of Cancer Research has one in July and National Academy of Sciences and Duke Margolis and a lot of these are funded by you know, FDA. I don't, I don't have a perfect answer for you beyond the fact that you know, in the case of those real world evidence projects, you know, I touch base a lot with those varying groups and we try and arrange the slices of the pie that, that we look at um, to try and balance you know, project portfolios. We, we do the same thing with Transcelerate. We've got kind of a quarterly meeting with them. And when we design our projects, we try and make them complementary, not overlapping. But it's imperfect, especially when you're trying to do with these consortium groups and get all the same experts in the same room. I, you know, I, I don't have a perfect answer. You know, it's, 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 it's a true problem. Yeah. Consortium fatigue. Yeah. Why don't we go right here? Hi, my name's Bobby Reed, and I'm an ambassador for the AAKP. I represent Pennsylvania. That's where I come from. Thank you. I'm also a caregiver um, to my adult son, who did receive a living donor transplant from a person that we did not know, non-related living donor that we found through the Alumni wow. Association at Penn State University. He felt that he wanted to give back, since they're real big blue and white give backers, and they gave back. But anyway. My question to you is this. I have two, actually. The first one is I'm involved with a research project right now as a patient partner with the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine, SIDM. And I wanted to know how your particular groups or how, where does that fall in the scenario? Because I looked at all the names that you had in all those categories, and um, I didn't see it there. But some of the things that we're working on, we. Uh, the project, what its goal, aim is to do is to improve diagnosis so they're more accurate, they're done earlier, and we're actually being paired with researchers so that we can develop research questions in the process that when they go to do those clinical trials or they want to write that proposal, that that information is at the forefront and we, uh, me as a patient partner, is providing that contribution. It's not strictly dealing with kidney disease, it's all the full spectrum of diseases that are addressed there. And we recently had our in-person patient meeting in Chicago a couple weeks ago, but it's an ongoing one-year-long funded project through PCORI. That's my first question. And I'll, I, I, my second question, and you can, I'll sit down and you can address both of them, is this. I mentioned that my son is a kidney transplant recipient, and the journey is never over. It's only a, a treatment, it's not a cure. And one of the obstacles, the great obstacles that we're facing now, um, I think, is the fact that he has to take um, steroids, pregnant to be exact, the five milligram dose. And my kid is usually the most easygoing, happy, athletic kid on earth. You know, to, you know, he's a young person. He was 22 years old when he graduated from college and had this happen. And, He's had his transplant now for two and a half years. Anyway, um, we're dealing with the adverse effects of that pregnizone. And early on when we went for our evaluation pre-surgical, one of the questions that I asked the um, doctor was, I read about a research study that was being done for anti-rejection medicine that was conducted out of Philadelphia. Mind you, we're in Pittsburgh. And the doctor promptly told me that if I wanted to gain access to that particular medication, which was getting ready, it was showing very promising results. It probably has been result, uh, released ever since. It didn't require as much medication, didn't have as many side effects. It sounded like, you know, gee, if, you know, it's for me. Uh, he said if we wanted to gain access to that, that we would have to go to Philadelphia and get our transplant there. And there we were at the door the doorstep, we had found our donor, and, I, and this was coming from a, an educational hospital, you know, university hospital. Uh, he said, we have our protocol, and that's not our protocol. And I'm very puzzled by that. If you've run into those um, obstacles and how you would ask to uh, address that, because here we are at this stage of the game where we're dealing with prednisone, it's not a happy situation. Is there, and on, one of the questions that I have for his doctor when he goes for his next follow-up visit post-transplant here is to say to him, can we switch this up? 
is there an opportunity to do this? Or if it's still not their protocol, for God's sake, what do we do? Because it's not a happy situation now. Granted, it's better than being on dialysis and being in kidney failure, but really your quality of life is impacted. Yeah. So those are my two questions. So if you can help me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to start and then give to Scott, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be incredibly unhelpful with both. Um, the, for, the, for the second one, I, I, I just, I, I don't know enough about the space to offer a very intelligent response, but I think, I think Scott will have one, but I would like to just say I am sorry. That sounds heartbreaking, and I hope to hear good things will follow. Um, regarding the diagnostics piece, um, yeah, that's tricky, right? Um, one of the stories that that I tell uh, most frequently, just kind of casually with friends and family, um, about this wacky um, world of medicine and, and pharmacology that we live in, uh, that, I, that I live in. Um, about tw uh, 20 years ago when I first started my career, I was a drug rep for a few years. And um, so carried the bag, you know, with the fancy suits. I was a cardiovascular guy. And um, so I'd call on doctors and talk to them about my meds. And I had this, this really smart, really difficult doctor that I would call on. And he, he sat, you know, 23-year-old Garrett down and, and told me a story about when he graduated med, you know, med school, like University of Pennsylvania or some, you know, wonderful Ivy League place. And, and the esteemed doctor that led the um, kind of graduation ceremony speech opened with 50% um, of what we taught you in the last seven years is, is spot on and absolutely correct. And 50% was dead wrong. And the problem is we don't know which, which, which half is which. Now, that was 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and that's an exaggerated story because there's been a lot of phenomenal games. I, mean, I don't have my father any longer, but my dad lived eight or nine years longer because of the cardiovascular meds that he was able to be on. There are victories in HIV and, and, and hepatitis C. I mean, there are victories. Now, there are absolute failures still, Alzheimer's and some other things. but. But the progression and, and the scientific improvement, you know, I think with cancer immunology type stuff, there's, the, the gains are obvious. But the diagnostic piece of figuring out who needs what, you know, these pdl ones and immunology therapies, who gets it, who's going to work on, I mean, we, do, we aren't as very sophisticated with biomarkers or, 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 or if you do kind of create a diagnostic capability, finding a way to make it an inexpensive rapid delivery test, You've highlighted an, an area of massive needs uh, for improvement. Well, I'll, I'll try to take on the second part of your question, which um, is equally frustrating, uh, I, especially as it relates to transplant drugs. And I can't say I have personal experience with transplant drugs. I've not worked with them before. Although I do know the protocols tend to be very challenging and very rigid. And once an institution tends to adopt a protocol, because there are so many specialties involved, they're loath to, to monkey around with them. But there's, there's another piece to it as well, which is, um, if you remember back in the early part of the uh, discussion, I talked about FDA approval and clinical trial investigator qualifications. And site to site, there are huge differences in terms of their uh, capacity to actually document uh, adequately the treatment, the response capture data electronically, the, the investigators have to be qualified. There's a, an enormous expense, actually, to starting up a new clinical trial site. And so you tend to, and just in statistical quirks, uh, you don't ever tend to want to have an investigator with just one or two patients. You tend to want to cluster them so they have a sort of a critical mass of patients. And so it's not terribly surprising to me that you know, that they would say you would have to go there. But then you also have that challenge of, okay, but when they come back to care under their regular care team, what's happened? They've changed the protocol and there's gonna be great discomfort. And I, I wish there was a better answer for you, but it, it is what it is. Um, if I can offer a quick opinion before we take the next question. Um, I take advantage of the contacts that are here. Uh, the chair of our medical advisory board, Dr. Stephen Fadum, is here, we introduced him earlier today, and uh, one of us here on the board will introduce you to him. But what you'll learn is that different transplant centers have different protocols. If you switch transplant centers, there's a counseling process that's involved in that. Well, they'll get involved with your son and describe what their difference in the protocol is, and what that means if they were to change. 
Um, I've had my transplant for 21 years. Richard Nelson's here, he's had his for 27. I've taken 144,000 pills since then. Mm. The number of times that the doses have changed or the recommendations that come from my own team to switch meds or go to generics uh, has been a phenomenal number of times. Each time I get a little bit uptight about it, but I always go out and get another opinion from another transplant center. It's made me a more effective patient, but what Scott was talking about in terms of the variety of opinions in transplant world is pretty stunning. The other person who will be here tomorrow is Peggy Tai, who is the uh, chief lobbyist for the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. She can give you several different names of uh, folks up in your state if you wanted to uh, seek a second opinion. And as an empowered patient, I'd encourage you to do that. Other questions? Yes, Elena, right in the back. <laughs> it's the most important one. <laughs> well, I'm not wearing my CMS hat, but I am wearing my CMS hat. <laughs> um, are you seeing, and I know you're just talking about like process, but are you seeing more trials being focused on non-white males, African Americans, females, because everything that comes out looks like Paul Conway. <laughs> You know, and not that it's a bad thing, but we do have a lot of other people out here. I mean, just look around the room. Yeah. And that has been the focus traditionally for years. And, you know, I'm here to advocate for women, you know, for people of color, you know, whether you're brown or yellow, you know, Native Americans. You know, are you seeing any difference in the trends? You want to say I've got some stuff, but. Um, so no, it's great. It's a great point. The good news, if there is some in the nephrology space, African Americans tend to be overly represented in our studies, um, just because the dialysis population tends to be overly represented by African Americans. Women is definitely a problem, um, and and there is focus on that. But again, this is it's a voluntary precipitation participation is, process and so that outreach is is um, sometimes a challenge I would say there's a lot of women's groups out there and just as we talked about when I presented earlier today we have kidney patients that are lawyers doctors hospitals whatever that also may be affiliated with various professional female groups or a woman's guild or things like that that I would you yeah. know encourage you Absolutely. as a female to look at you know, networking with some of the non-traditional groups because, like, we worked with AKP because it's CMS. I can't go into a dialysis unit and knock on a door to get patients. So I also mm. have to partner with different groups. And, you know, we have, you know, we tried to get, you know, when we did our last focus group, we didn't want professional patients because we all know there's patients at different levels. Those that are very engaged, empowered, and know how to communicate with high-level officials and stuff. And it's especially hard when you're looking for mainstream, like I said, the truck driver, the patient aid, you know, the whatever. So that it's not easy. I recognize that. Like I said, it took us a year to get our population together. And I'm surprised that, you know, Aaron and Diana are still upright because they, I mean, they yeah. literally beat every bush between here and Albuquerque. Yeah. Um, but I would just encourage that to look for some of the non-traditional places because we need more representation. Yeah, no question. Okay. Yeah, d definitely a problem, always has been a problem. I, I do have a couple positive stories here. I, I don't have uh, as much of the um, uh, female side of things as far as stories, but as far as um, African American and Hispanic or, or, um, or Latin American uh, groups, also you know, grossly underrepresented. And frankly, just uh, overall, just healthcare recipients are, aren't, are, are suffering in kind of those groups. But um, there are some organ there are some kind of new age companies that well Paul and I have come across due, due to our work in decentralized clinical trials where you're trying to bring the clinical trial to the home through telemedicine mobile nursing etc um, you know at, at city you don't advocate on behalf of any different companies but just right. ones that we've worked with um, science 37 transparency life sciences global care clinical trials these folks are do are growing in number and masses because they're they're bringing it to the patients and the benefit and recruitment and retention and speed is wonderful. The other thing that they are finding as a byproduct, it's a much more diverse group ethnically, and it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, for for all the obvious reasons. Um, 
you know, yeah, we don't all look like Paul. I think Paul is basically <laughs> the I'm three sorry, of us. Paul, well, the I'm three of us. We got, we've got, we've got three do. Pauls here. I think <laughs> we make up about 15% yeah, no, of the room. I, I know I could get away with it. It's oh, okay. Yeah. If, oh, yeah. if you harass me enough, you get a president's award. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, right, Jenny. Hello, um, my name's Jenny Kitson and I'm on the AAKP board. And I've been involved in the end stage renal disease program since 1969. So, been on advisory committees, technical whatevers, and uh, watched lots of different studies, participated in them. After all of those years, I still cannot understand why are IRBs so different from place to place? And why are they so difficult to work with? And who controls them or teaches them or does something yeah. with them to standardize this? Because yeah. right now I'm in the middle of one project that involves three different IRBs. And if you change yeah. a one word on one proposal in one sentence, you got to go to all of the other IRBs. You, you both referenced it in terms yeah. of how delay, the time yeah. consuming, costly it is. It's nuts. There's got to be some kind of, I'm sorry to vent, but oh, no, 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 <laughs> there has to, to be some kind no. of criteria for little changes versus important changes. Yeah, I just, I'm, for I'm, years, I'm, don't want to get it. I'm so I'm grateful for, one, I, I hear you. It's just, just, just a nightmare. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for these last two questions because I can at least offer some glimmer of hope with both of them. Or with the first two, it was, you know, I, I didn't have much good stuff to say. Uh, optimistic, positive things to share. So, so this is an area that that cities had a lot of, of work in. A colleague of mine was kind of spearheaded it, but I've, I've talked about it in the past. I know a decent amount about it. So, there's been a movement over the last five, six, seven years towards central IR, central or now single IRB is what they're called. And and she told me five, six years ago when she started this work, she would go into a room of IRB professionals and they would practically throw stones at her. You know. Um, but the evolution of that, I was at a conference last year where there were a lot of talks. The evolution towards you know, these multi-site single IRBs, it's been substantial. And now you've got, we've got a slew of, of recommendations also, again, on, online about this, online free access to everybody. You know, and one of the big things is to try and push sponsors to require a single IRB. Well, in the last year, the NIH finally got, finally was able to push through their, I believe it's a regulation, um, that's going to require for NIH-funded studies the use of a single IRB. And now we've just partnered with them. So this, this may not even be kind of, no, this isn't pub public complete information yet. NIH has a Federal <laughs> Register notice on, um, on work that they're going to do on policy analysis for how to effectively institute single IRBs. Um, the, the, move, the needle is definitely moving. And, and it's moving at an increasingly quick pace. There's a lot of groups involved in work on it. And you know, it's kind of like how when California makes a law about emissions, their economy is so big that it often dictates what happens in the, the rest of the country. Now, NIH-funded studies obviously aren't kind of the FDA regulatory kinds, but it's so significant that, that you know, I think it, it'll end up bleeding into sites and IRBs, et cetera. So it's already starting to improve, but I anticipate a good bolus of, uh, of movement there because of, because of this big policy. Um, what Garrett's referencing is uh, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, NIDDK, um, has launched the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, KPMP, and that is one of the actual projects that drives uh, this move to a central IRB. And so there's been a lot of work on that. Richard Knight here is on the steering committee for it. Oh, are you? Um, and uh, Dr. Robert Starr, the head of NIDDK, will be here. He'll also take questions on clinical trials and uh, IRBs. But uh, with that, I'd like to thank our guests very much uh, for being here, and thank you. Wow, it's so fun. Yeah.